Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mayor Capital Q&A for the third quarter of 2023. As always, the Q&A uh, part of the title gives away the, uh, the intention here. We want questions from you, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions uh, ahead of time. We'll be going through those. Uh, I've taken the liberty of summarising some of them if they are on common topics or slight variations uh, on a theme. If you feel like we don't answer this, please reach out to us after the session and we'll do our best to uh, get back to you with an answer. And of course, feel free to um, submit questions as the uh, session goes on. But we've got a, a number of questions, so we'll dive straight into it. And something that I guess is dominating the headlines at the moment, which is Middle Eastern conflict. Um, I don't think the region's a stranger to, to this um, conflict, but the, it's certainly the case that um, it's flared up in a way that hasn't for some years. Um, I guess our job's not really to solve these issues, but instead to think about how it affects equity markets. So what is our assessment of of how issues like this affect equity markets? Well, I think to start with, uh, I must say that I'd be a bit crass to jump too quickly into the impact on markets uh, when a topic like this is brought over. But we've all seen then stuff in the news, and this has been particularly depressing. What's in this story. I think. It is certainly a very dark time in the history of the world, the history of humanity, I think, uh, to watch this. Uh, so it's incredibly, it's incredibly negative from a humanitarian point of view. Uh, and I just wanted to bring that up first uh, before trying to talk about equities and how they're impacted. Historically, uh, uh, wars and, and conflict, unless they're specific to uh, the equities of the country that's taking part, is global markets have tended to shrug them off for a while at least, uh, at least historically. Now, in cases where these things have escalated and become global conflicts, uh, that has, markets have basically been wrong in, in assessing that. If you kind of want to look at World War I, World War II. Now, the speed of information has, has changed tremendously, obviously, since that period. Uh, but if markets are not pricing in any kind of global conflict, I guess, is, is, uh, is, is what I would, wanted to say. Could there be impact on the global economy? I mean, there could be a secondary impact from higher energy prices. That could be a way where it impacts the global economy, but <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be heading in that way. And then I don't foresee it happening that way as, as the base case. But obviously, this thing is changing very dramatically. And uh, the, the role of regional and global superpowers in, in this conflict as it evolves will will have an impact on the assessment from a risk perspective uh, on that. But the base case is essentially this is a human disaster, uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, have a material impact on uh, global equities. Uh, understood, understood. Um, Aubrey, if you could you add anything to that? Or, you know, we all recognise the no, human tragedy, just, but... No, it's just horrible what's happening. I mean, I don't think there's anything to add further to what was used to said. OK, thank you. Uh, we're going to stick with uh, macro for the time being. Um, do we expect a hard landing towards the end of the year or perhaps the beginning of the first half of next year? And if yes, what are the main leading factors you usually prioritise when looking at that? Is it unemployment rates? Is it interest rates, some other macro indicator that? Well, let me first, I guess, address what do people mean when they talk about a hard landing? So there is hard landing is more of a 
media term than an economic term. Uh, and the idea comes basically from, say there's a there's an aviation anal analogy here. But basically, as interest rates go up, is is the act of higher interest rates gonna cause a recession or not? And when they people say it's a soft landing, they mean that interest rates can go up to manage inflation without tipping the economy into a recession. And a hard landing means that that doesn't happen and, and you do end up with a recession. Now, historically, periods of increasing interest rates have, with very few exceptions, there are a couple of exceptions, to be fair, but in the majority of cases have caused a recession. And the reason that is the case is not that it, this is a accidental byproduct. The, the reason you want to increase rates to address uh, inflation is, or the mechanism by where that addresses inflation is by slowing the economy down. So that's by design. The idea is you're going to slow the economy down so that inflation can cool off and you basically overdo it. So it's not like this secondary perpendicular effect or anything like that. Uh, how you, you get it to the right amount is, is, uh, is the question. My view is that overly focusing on whether it's a recession or not is missing the point. Because uh, in the end of it, if you think about it, let's say that, and, and in the US that's not the definition, but let's say that the definition is that you've got a couple of quarters of negative uh, uh, growth. Uh, but essentially you've got negative, a period of negative growth across the economy. Let's just say that that is a recession. Does it really matter whether growth is minus 0.5% or plus 0.5%? Uh, I personally don't think it matters. I, I think this artificial line at zero doesn't really mean anything. What we do know is that in many parts of the economy, starting about this time last year, we've seen treme a tremendous slowdown uh, in, in, uh, in, in production. And in many places we've seen uh, a, a, a decline in, in production that hasn't happened in at least 10 years. Uh, so if it hasn't been widespread, uh, wide, uh, spread across the economy for the whole thing to cause uh, a negative GDP print, although in some countries it has happened. Uh, but, I, but I think overly fixating on whether the UK is, has grown 0.5% or Germany has declined or half a percent or whatever is, is, is artificial. There's no, a second to you, it's not an artificial line. And it seems that we've already had this slowdown. The real question is, uh, or there are real, two real questions. One is, is the slowdown uh, slash recession or whatever you want to call it already happened? Uh, the indication is that things are starting to pick up. So it may have already happened and we're already on the other end of it. Uh, or is this just going to be a, a while where we, we, we have the slowdown and then eventually things recover? Uh, the, the real answer is I don't know. And, and, and frankly, I don't think anyone knows. Uh, there is no doubt that there is a slowdown. That's by design. Uh, the U.S. economy seems to be chugging along a bit better than others. So maybe in the U.S. rates do need to go higher or stay higher for longer. Uh, because it doesn't seem that things have slowed down in, uh, enough. Does that impact in, in the way we invest? It really doesn't. I mean, in the end, three, five years from now, which is our investment horizon, in the way you look at things, what happens in the next three quarters or two quarters isn't really going to make a difference. It would, it would matter if you're buying over leveraged cyclical companies, but that's not what we do. Uh, so we... This is more of intellectual curiosity than in any practical implication to an investment process. Aubrey? Well, I guess, you know, we do factor in, in a certain way, which is that we think about probability scenarios. We think about, you know, the bull case, the bear case. And the bear case is usually what happens if there's a recession and does that recession permanently impact the business that we're looking at? Now, you know, we have looked at businesses in the past where it would because they have a lot of debt maturities coming up uh, in the near future, and you know, those we might want to pass on because that that's the sort of scenario where you know you could have a permanent uh, impact on the business. But you know, uh, 
I mean, look, you know, I'm really grateful that we don't have to forecast macro. It's uh, yeah, you know, uh, but yeah, I would say we do factor in what might happen, you know, uh, into our into our modeling scenarios. And it's not, you know, but we are then looking long term. So, you know, if if you have a short term blip, you know, does the cash flow in the next three years impact uh, the business? How does that uh, how does that happen? Does that you know, reduce uh, you know their competitiveness. Uh, does it increase it? You know, could you actually find that recession makes uh, some company a category killer? No. There, there are a whole load of things that you know we think about, but it's not necessarily to do with is there a recession. It's you know what what might happen to the businesses. You know, how will the businesses react? Will they become better businesses? Will they become worse businesses? Yeah, and that then plays into our scenarios. Um, yeah, I guess this is a better way of putting it in, in, in the sense that we always factor in a recession. Because <laughs> yes. uh, the truth is, if you're going to own something for multiple years, you're going to head to recession at some point. Uh, well, but I guess it, it doesn't matter whether it happens next quarter or three years from now. The business has to be able to do well regardless. Exactly. And I guess that's the reason why you're looking for what we call great businesses and great companies is because, at, as you say, at some point, recessionary forces will be at play. How does a company navigate that and the, the quality speaks to how likely they are to be able to achieve that. Yeah, I, I mean, if you if you if you own a business and you're going to own it for a very long time, I mean, think of if you had a family business that you own, you own yourself with a family, you don't go around thinking, oh, what am I going to do if there's a recession? There will be a recession. There's no doubt that there's going to be a recession. At it's some point, that. it's a question of when and not if. You're going to have a recession every now and then, yeah. and you have to be prepared for it. And you need to make sure that a recession doesn't kill you or hamper your long-term potential. Okay, and I guess that's true of um, portfolios as well. You have to make sure those downturns, as you, to use your phrase, don't kill the, the portfolio. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we if we didn't want to manage risk and we could predict when a recession is going to happen, we, <laughs> we'd be making way more money, but, but we don't manage money that way. We manage money with the idea that you're going to have to have a, a balance in your portfolio because you're going to have good periods, you're going to have bad periods, and you need to basically stay uh, healthy and, and survive these things. Uh, if someone could guarantee that the recession is not going to happen, the portfolio would be different. Yeah. Well, let's, um, let's dive a little bit into markets now and uh, still focusing at a, a, a broader level. Which is who is the next? Uh, who's going to be the next member of the trillion dollar club? Who's going to be the next member to be evicted? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, first of all, why why does that matter? It does, it, does it matter? It does not. So it really is. It's back to your point of you know, yeah. does fifty basis points uh, yeah. make a difference? It, it's a number, uh, arbitrary number in the sand. I mean, people just love numbers, like. Media loves numbers, but does it is, is is do you learn anything by a company being 975 billion market cap or a trillion and 25? No, nothing. Doesn't mean and and frankly, market capitalization of, of a company does not matter as to whether or not it's a good investment either. Uh, in the end, you need to think through things on a per share basis, and uh, if you, I could go if if I'm Apple, I could go and buy. I don't know, 20 companies and I could double my market share. Doesn't mean I'm going to add value. It doesn't mean anything. If, if Apple and Microsoft and Google were allowed to merge, I mean, it's a big question whether, but, or, or, or just to make it easier, if Apple and Walmart and Johnson Johnson decided to merge, you're going to end up with a bigger market cap. You're not going to end up with a better company. So, so I guess it's not something to pay a great deal of attention no. to. Who would have thought NVIDIA would have joined us, you know, uh, three years ago? True. Well, I'm glad you brought NVIDIA up because uh, there is... Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should um, uh, go into this in a little bit more detail. And it's, I, I'm going to tie it to a, a broader question about how um, we've changed the strategy or whether we would change the strategy. So. We don't own NVIDIA. We don't own a couple of the so-called Magnificent Seven uh, for now. We can go into the reasons for that. And you know, what lessons have you learned and how have your strategy may change as a result of that? So I guess you know, 
if we did our time again, would we buy all these stocks? I guess knowing what we knew at the time. <laughs> I mean, of, of course, of course, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, we would. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah, but what we knew at the time uh, is 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 really the the key. Uh, I really don't think so. I I don't think it would change anything. I mean, the benefit of hindsight is obviously is, there are a lot of you could make more money. By the way, if you had perfect hindsight, that'd be in buying video because it creates little uh, pink sheet stocks all day long. Uh, the, the, the truth is, we have a, a process that operates on the assumption that bad things could happen, and we don't want to make too many assumptions about the future in in our investment. That's kind of at the core of it, and and the result is we're not going to pay high multiples of current earnings because we think at some future date the growth is going to be so astronomical that the valuation is going to catch up. Uh, at that point, this is kind of essentially what defines a value investor. Right? We, and I think Aubrey came up with it, with coined the term many years uh, ago. Occam's razor: basically, the best investment is one that requires the uh, fewest number of assumptions. Occam's investment. Oh, sorry, Occam's investment. Yeah. Occam's sorry. razor is. It's, uh, it's not you. Yeah. Uh, Occam's investment. Uh, William Occam. That's like 16th century philosopher. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, so I, the idea is basically we're not. When something, I don't know what the multiple, do you know what the multiple it's trading at? Really? Yeah, no, there's no, because no, 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 10 years ago, it was trading at one time sales. Five years ago, it was trading at five time sales. Today, it trades at 33 time sales. I mean, it was about 100 time sales yeah, uh, a few weeks ago. I mean, that was before they printed their last set of numbers and uh, before the market cap came off a little bit. But yeah, and okay, yes. I wish we had bought it when it was at five times sales. We did look at it, and the whole host of reasons that we did, you know, we felt uncomfortable with it. And it was still expensive there because the profitability wasn't there as well. Um, you know, but the level of growth it now requires, you know, so 33 times sales, you know, let's assume that they have, you know, a 30% margin or will have a 30% margin. That means it's actually 100 times EBIT. Yeah, okay, so let's now assume that we'd be happy to pay 20 times EBIT, which is a, a big premium, that, and we rarely ever would pay 20 times EBIT for a business, but let's say we would. That means they have to grow their EBIT at 50x. They have to, their EBIT needs to be 50 times bigger. Uh, so what, what does that look like to uh, as a business? Yeah. Have they, have yeah. they set, is there an NVIDIA product in every house in the, on the planet, or? Well, well, their revenue has to grow, you know, uh, some like 40, uh, Percent K a year for 10 years for that to happen. I, I mean, I don't think that's just a sort of NVIDIA product in every household. It's an NVIDIA product on every finger, you know, on, uh, you know in every pocket. Um, uh, I mean, it may happen. It may happen. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's just such a lot of assumptions that we'd have to make to get there that, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do that. Uh, I can't make that many assumptions and have any confidence, you know, and that's just to get sort of fair value. That's not even to outperform. <laughs> it's to outperform. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I wrote about the uh, the, the seven names in, in 2000 in, in my letter uh, this quarter, and how you've got these seven wonderful businesses, uh, the exception of GE, but. So it should we remind yeah. people who uh, may not have uh, yet read, I'm sure they will. Be well, ready. essentially what I looked at is I looked at the seven largest names in, in, during the tech bubble. Uh, and with, with, with one exception, with the benefit of hindsight, these businesses did between well and tremendously well over the following 15 years. Uh, but the stocks went nowhere. And the reason is basically you paid such a high multiple that even if you knew for a fact what's going to evolve in, from a business point of view, you still didn't make money. You still eventually either lost money or, or make, made very little money. And, and, and there are ways to, and, and lower risk ways to make no money you can buy treasuries. So it just, I mean, there is valuation matters. And if you overpay for growth, eventually you're going to be disappointed. And I think collectively, uh, whether NVIDIA specifically, it may have been an extreme example, but with, with these with the seven stocks, I think the, the, the probability of you doing well over time from this starting point 
strikes me as exceptionally low. Uh, and by the way, it's not that you've made no money for 15 years. You, at some point, were down in some of these names 90%. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not like you've gone nowhere flat. And, but you, you could have lost 90% of your money, 70%, 60%, depending on the name. Uh, and, and, and some of these things, I mean, I mean, Microsoft is one of them, but I think I wrote it down here. But in, in the case of Microsoft, it took you 14 years to break even. So your money went nowhere for 14 years, but at some point you were down 70 percent. And and during this period, profit went up by two and a half X. It's not this is a business that wasn't doing well, but even if you held Microsoft to today and now it's in the trillion dollar, dollar cup and again, potentially arguably at the top of another bubble. It was it was a journey of, of pain where up until recently you didn't even outperform the S&P and you took all this risk. So you've got lost 70 percent at some point, waited 14 years to break even, waited another several years to to catch up with the S&P and only towards the last two by by virtue of it being in a bubble that you outperformed by a little bit. So. It just it strikes me as an irrational uh, bet to make, uh, but people are happy to make it. And I, I use the Cinderella, call it the Cinderella theory of investing, in, in my letter. Uh, some people just can't help it. They when the music is playing, they need to get up and dance. And, <laughs> and we, you know what? It's 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 not a it's a very dangerous game. And I think uh, I think Charlie Munger once said thing about life is that just don't do stupid things. So uh, I, I think he said it's, it's very simple to do to do well. Just don't chase trains and don't do it drugs and it'll be OK. <laughs> and it's like, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just, this is not a game that we like to play. We think it's a game that is very irrational. Some people can't help themselves. The There is a cost to pay for not playing this game, which is every few years these things happen. and. Here we are sitting on the sidelines looking like idiots for not buying these things. I, I wouldn't change the, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, but knowing what we knew then, uh, I, I wouldn't change anything. And, and frankly, if I were an investor in our investors' shoes and we suddenly started paying 100 times EBIT for stocks, I, I would redeem, to be completely honest. I mean, I'd, I'd question our judgment that, uh, at the very least, a style shift. But potentially we've lost our mind. And I, I guess the performance of Nvidia and the other um, stocks in the, in that uh, in that that club has had an effect on maybe investor psychology, where they see market return being whatever it is up 10, 11 percent uh, this year. But is the market really up that 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 much? And as a result, I guess the follow-on question that we get asked regularly and including for this, is now a good time to invest? If the market's gone up, then surely one should wait. Is, what's your assessment of that? Well, the market has not gone up if you look at it through the lens of the average stock. Uh, and it's been actually tremendously disappointing performance for most stocks the past two to three uh, so a lot of there's this thing about oh when rates go up how how is it that equities are doing well equities are not doing well the average stock is not doing well uh, as as rates have come up and and as, as the business cycle has slowed down uh, but what you do have is you've got a handful of names that have basically gone completely disconnected from business fundamentals and that artificially boosted the index but if you just look under these these names, the market has not gone up, uh, and this is actually it is it is similar to what happened in 1999 and 2000, where the average stock was actually reasonably priced with one sector, and back then or or, or, the, or three three industries, TMT, being extremely overvalued. And what ended up happening is if you owned everything except the crazy expensive names. Even when the index went down 70, 80 percent, driven by these things, you actually made money. Uh, and I think this is what's going to happen this this time around. I think if you, there are many reasonably priced good businesses out there that you can buy and do well over the next five years. I think the index will not do well, but because just like it was lifted upwards with the weight of 
these names, which are now 30 something percent of the index, I think they're going to come down. And I think that's going to uh, hold back the index for the few years to come. But I think if you own the average stock today, you're going to do well over the next few years. I, I certainly feel that our existing portfolio uh, is extremely attractive. I, I'm, I'm going to make a bet, actually, that the next five years on a relative basis because of this index phenomenon might be one of our best relative performance periods since inception. OK, uh, uh, would, would having a chart to hand to illustrate that be useful? Would you yeah, I mean, I mean, we shared one in the letter. Uh, uh, I've, I, I, I'm going to try and uh, uh, I'm try and get it on the screen. Let's see. If this... well, I mean, it does remind me, uh, as you say, of the sort of 2000 bubble, because one of the things that you know happened during that was that all these tech stocks were, you know, uh, sucking up capital you know, from other stocks. So it wasn't just that those stocks were expensive, but it actually made other stocks yeah, cheap. Exactly. And so a lot of stock pickers did super well during that period. And I think, and look, you know, our whip uh, list of new ideas is, you know, probably more full than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, we've recently bought, you know, you know, uh, you know, new stocks, which well, you've mentioned. Yeah. You know, well, um, we've bought we've bought one also since the end of quarter, but well, that'll be that'll be for the next quarter. Yes. But you know, but, but one of those is sort of picks and shovel, which I could quite easily see having capital having been sucked from that to other, um, you know, these high growth names. And yeah, we're sort of you know working flat out on these new ideas because, as I said, I think they've sucked capital away from you know these really great businesses that are just not as exciting, you know, to the uh, you know at today. But like you said, five years from now, uh, you know, I think. Well, this is the chart that we used to use internally for many years, and we, I think, shared it uh, with you. Uh, when was the first time you shared it? Maybe a year ago or, or thereabout. Uh, so there, this is a, an updated version of it. But the, the blue line is essentially our five-year average uh, portfolio upside. Uh, what we think the portfolio is going to do over the next five years in terms of absolute return uh, before mistakes, of course. But <laughs> gross of mistakes. Uh, but, but this is our estimate of what we think the upside is in our portfolio. And it, you can see a range around it because we do use a probability distribution around this estimate. Uh, and you can see that internally, we think this is one of the most attractive forward looking portfolios that we've ever owned. And so when you see us being aggressive in, in terms of not holding cash and Kind of adding to the portfolio, adding to some of our holdings. It's because we really think it's an extremely attractive portfolio with a lot of upside. I have no idea when the index dynamic is going to change to cause the relative uh, outperformance to to take care of itself. That's a matter of time. It's, it's impossible to predict. It may happen in the next three months. It may have to take three years. I really don't know. But in terms of absolute return over the next five years. Uh, I have a very high confidence in our portfolio. I, I think it's extremely attractive. Okay, well, I don't think we've got any uh, further questions. So unless there's any closing comments, we can leave it there. We're bang on uh, the 30-minute mark uh, here, which is uh, our intention. So as always, we'd like to thank you for your attention and, and your continued support. Uh, if you'd like any more answers or more detailed answers to the questions or topics we've covered today, please feel free to uh, email or phone, uh, WhatsApp, either me or Sophie or the IR inbox. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in person or on the next call. So until then, thank you very much for joining and goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.